Welcome everyone to the Co-Creators Convergence Thursday Night Creator Convo. I'm Noelle Marshall and I'm here with my beloved Bob Warner. Hi everyone, glad to have you with us this evening and watching us in timeless time on a recording at some other time on planet Earth. Great to have you here, Patrick. We are very happy to have Patrick back. It was very informative last time, so I'm setting a high bar of expectation, Patrick, which I know you're going to meet. And uh, so before we begin, I just want to tell uh, our viewers a little bit about the Co-Creators Convergence. And we have a surprise introduction, shall we say. Hello, my name is Karen Trujillo Heffernan, and I'm so grateful to be offering this being a part of Co-Creators Convergence. Um, I have been a part of Co-Creators Convergence for I'm not even sure how many years now. I've, I've pretty much as long as I've known Bob and Noel and since they started Co-Creator Convergence and these conversations. And it's really an honor for me tonight to be introducing who our speaker is, Patrick Heffernan. And Patrick and I have known each other all of his life. He is my son. And we have really been on this phenomenal journey together this past year as it relates to rhythm. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about realigning rhythms. And I wanted to just take a moment and share some things about Patrick in this past year and what an impact he's had on my life because he is my coach. I have been in his coaching program for 11 months now and it has been all about realigning rhythm. So Patrick will definitely be sharing some details about himself as he is speaking tonight and sharing with you about rhythm. And he was, since I would say about 12 years old, always excited to be in rhythm when it came to dance. And he studied professionally to be a dancer. He's performed professionally. So one thing that Patrick does know a lot about is rhythm. Yet what I've learned and what he's going to be sharing tonight with us is about our inner rhythms. What happens when we are out of alignment with the rhythm of our bodies? with the rhythm of nature. And I'm so excited to see how much Patrick has embraced and grown in this arena of um, his body thriving, of how, how many risks he's taken to become in true alignment with his self, with his soul. And for those of, the, of you that know me, I'm all about surfing in your soul and something that we're going to watch tonight or be a part of tonight with Patrick is how he is surfing in his soul. He has spent many, many years in the yoga community, practicing yoga, teaching yoga. And again, as I said, many years formally dancing. But I think the greatest honor for me to introduce 
you know, to, to say about him tonight as I'm introducing him, you can hear me get choked up a bit, is just to watch my own child, my own son, become such a leader in how we can live from the truth and the rhythm of our heart, the value of how this impacts our body, and how it allows us to shine. So you're in for just a great ride tonight with Patrick. And I, I just uh, hope you all enjoy very much. Patrick, I love you. And um, I really honor you for stepping out into this world and building beloved community. So welcome, Patrick. I hope um, you enjoyed that intro by someone who's known you all your life. That was kind of shocking that your mom has known you all your life. So it was really, I tell you, she was a one take wonder. So we put that together and uh, really looking forward to your uh, sharing tonight. So without any further ado, Patrick, I'm gonna ask you to take it away. You're beautiful. And uh, we're gonna enjoy this evening together. Thank you and thank you all for coming. Wow, that was uh, that was awesome. What an introduction. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to take all that in because it was uh, so much movement in me, interestingly. You know, watching kind of like Noel just said and my mom said, this person I've known all my life, like quite literally like <laughs> came out of, right? So the, the deepest and closest connection that I've ever had and then for that relationship to be evolutionary and one that's not, um, I guess, fixed or, or, or permanent, but rather it's plastic. And yeah, I guess it's, uh, I also just want to point out that I feel like I've, I've got to go some places with my mom, you know, spiritually in places of real emotional depth and, and maturity that I feel very, very fortunate to have the chance to have engaged with her in that way. It's been a huge part of my healing journey, to be honest. And so, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I wanna introduce myself. I wanna tell you a little bit about, a little bit about who I am, what my mom didn't say. <laughs> I guess my reputation precedes me. Um, hopefully I can live up to what, was, what she said and how we, yeah, exactly, like use this idea of rhythm to help have a more useful experience in the world. So anyways, my name is Patrick. This is a picture of me on the beach in Mexico earlier this year in January, which was just like a really, really wonderful trip that I got to take and it helped me deepen this um, love that I have for travel and not just travel, but I guess the experience of other cultures and the rhythms of other cultures and to tap into a different set of rhythm. And maybe it does have something to do with this idea that I'm a dancer, like my mom mentioned, but you know, rhythm doesn't just exist as a, in music. Although I don't know if anyone else was kind of like bopping along to that, that video. <laughs> it's like really beautiful beat there. I was totally bopping around along, but we also get an experience of what that rhythm is in culture and in nature, and there's a sense of rhythm to our bodies, in our minds, in our, our breath. And so really all of these ideas that I'm starting to string together about how rhythm influences our, our lives and the trajectory of our evolution comes from my work as a yoga health coach. I have 500 hours yoga teacher training, but I also bring to the table like I'm a musical theater guy. I spent a whole bunch of years performing in, in Broadway musicals all around the country. And so I'm also a tap dancer and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So this, again, relationship that I have with rhythm. A little bit more about who I am, uh, really feeling into my role as a thought leader these days. You know, not so much in telling people what to think, but rather with helping provide them with structures structures perhaps to help build a framework that becomes the context that you view the world with because everything that I'm, I'm reading and I'm listening to that seems to be a synchronicity that it's like just super important to have a constructive context of your experience 
you know, so often people get caught up in the content of what's going on, the content of their life, but it's really the context and the frame of mind that helps determine that that helps to determine the experience. And that has everything to do with our thoughts and our thought structures. So this is how I'm starting to think about thought leadership a little bit. I lead a couple of online communities. Journey to the Peak is a monthly yoga immersion. I work with my colleague in New York City, Shauna Emmerich, to run that community. And then Journey to You is a year-long kind of transformational journey. We work through Ayurvedic habits and a lot of identity evolution. And, and you know, we do it as a group. And I guess that's that's one of the things that I'm really excited to be talking about tonight is the idea of, of community, because it seems to be so much behind the mission of what this, this group is, at least my familiarity with this group. And so I'm, I'm really into this book right now that's called Community. I'd be curious, Bob and Noel, if you, if you know it. Um, I'll keep on checking in the chat too for anything. But um, so he's been really, he's writing about how the book is called Community, The Structure of Belonging. And he's writing about how a lot of the communities that you know, we see today in the world, there's sometimes structures of like fear and isolation or even fragmentation. And just like within the structure of the community, those elements can be present. And like we see this even in, in families, right? Sometimes there's a dynamic in a family in that structure that actually tends more towards fear, isolation, or fragmentation than it does towards belonging. So he's doing this huge thrust to try to promote communities to, to actually transform into communities of belonging. We've gotten really good at helping individuals transform and figure out how they can kind of harness their, their willpower to live a better, more empowered life and commit to a practice and self-realize. But how have we been doing at getting that to happen collectively? Because it's as important, this is a huge, huge concept, is that as much as we are individuals, we are collectives. And we are a collective. It's a part of the identity. So if we can evolve that part too, I guess it's going to create a world of more belonging. And so I was hoping we could actually tap into a little bit of that tonight. I wanted to engage the community. I don't know if it's kosher, Bob and Noel, to like, if people want to unmute and respond to, to questions, but is that allowed? Whatever. Everything's allowed. So yes. uh, you can say the word. So if everyone would like to uh, turn on your video and unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to come join this conversation. And uh, yeah. Cool. So I'm gonna read, I'm gonna frame this with a little section of the book that's about questions. And it's interesting because it's like, he talks a lot about what makes a good question. And this section is subtitled questions with great power. The questions that have the power to make a difference are the ones that engage people in an intimate way, confront them with their freedom and invite them to co-create a future possibility. Hashtag co-creators convergence. Achieving accountability and commitment entails the use of questions through which in the act of answering them, we become co-creators of the world. It does not matter what our answers to the questions are. The questions have an impact, even if the response is to refuse to answer them. I nearly want to read that, that part again. To state more dramatically, powerful questions are the ones that cause you to become an actor as soon as you answer them. You no longer have the luxury of being a spectator in whatever it is you are concerned about. Regardless how you answer these questions, you are guilty, guilty of having created this world. Not a pleasant thought, but the moment we accept the idea that we have created the world, we have the power to change it. Powerful questions are also, powerful questions also express the reality that change, like life, is difficult and unpredictable. They open up the conversation. In okay. All right, so basically he's trying to just get down to like, what makes a good question? And he says a good question has three qualities. One, it's ambiguous. There's no attempt to try to, okay, someone else is trying to come in. We're, we're not gonna let him in. Okay, are you able to see these as well? Uh, yes. 
Okay, not, cool. Then I'm not, not letting them in. We, yes, or, but we, they keep moving as you know. Um, so you think you're clicking it, and it's it's moved to another section. I just locked the meeting so no one else can come in. Okay. All right. It's just cool. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just going to be us, uh, and there might be another person on here. Um, I'm recording those. Well, I would have been curious to hear their answer to the question I'm going to ask in a second. But anyways, <laughs> one, it's ambiguous, okay? So there's no attempt to precisely define what is meant by the question. This requires each person bring their own personal meaning into the room. Two, it is personal. All passion, commitment, and connection grow out of what is most personal. Right. We need to create space for the personal. Three, it evokes anxiety. All that matters makes us anxious. It is our wish to escape from anxiety that steals our aliveness. If there is no edge to the question, there is no power. Questions themselves are an art form worthy of a lifetime of study. They are what transform the hour. Here are some questions that have the capacity to open the space for a different future. What is the commitment you hold that brought you here into this room? What is the price you or others pay for being here today? How valuable do you plan for this effort to be? What is the crossroads you face at this stage of the game? What is the story you keep telling about the problems of this community? What are the gifts you hold that have not been brought fully into the world? What is your contribution to the very thing you complain about? What is it about you or your team, group, or neighborhood that no one knows? So just this last paragraph, these questions have the capacity to move something forward. And we will explore them and others in more depth in the coming chapters. But by answering these questions, we become more accountable, more committed, more vulnerable. And when we voice our answers to one another, we grow more intimate and connected. This really moves me. And so I thought it would be nice to kind of kick off the discussion with this question. And you're invited to you know, unmute yourself and speak into the space. And yeah, with all of that framing that he just did there, it's like the question can be rejected. The question can be wrong. The, the answer can be wrong. It's like you get to become a conscious actor when you answer it and participate. So whoever would like to share, you're more than welcome. Why was it important for you to be here tonight? Um, it's I'll, I'll start. It's always okay. important for me to be here when Bob and Noel present something. If I'm available, I must be there because <laughs> they bring good stuff to a lot of people. And it's um, it's really important to me. I feel like they're um, they're a network. They network. They have networked me with things that I would never have dreamed about before I knew them. And then to top it off, to see Karen's son was going to be on here, then I knew, yes, you must make it tonight. <laughs> uh. So that's kind of my, my commitment to my friends who bring me, uh, bring me joy. Uh, that's beautiful. Thank you. That's beautiful. Noel, why was it important for you to be here tonight? Uh, well, it was important for me to be here because I feel this is a, uh, uh, being a steward of the co-creators convergence is um, my mission. Mm. And so it's to mm. bring people together. Uh, you know, we, we call this a creator convos for conversationalists. We love having conversations and to, uh, you know, once a week, I look forward to this time because I always learn something. I always develop new relationships and, um, there's something that we do with this creator convo is that once someone is a guest and you might know, remember this, Patrick, we invite that guest. We say, we don't know all the fabulous people doing all the fabulous things in the world. Who would you suggest we invite next? So it's kind of like a share it forward. Yeah. So um, that's our way of creating community. And it really helped, especially we, we, we started doing it more often. We used to do this once a month. We started doing it weekly during COVID and it's really been so successful. We're just going to keep doing it. So, um, you know, and the 
presentations of people, the conversations just get richer and richer. So who doesn't want to be involved in a rich conversation? <laughs> oh my God. I mean, I think you're completely right. And I think it's like, that's community. You know, as you were sharing that, I just pictured this like almost, you know, ink splotch or web spreading out and out and out, you know, and it's, it really doesn't take that long before you're global. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, it, this network of connectivity that is the container of the community, it's, um, it's so supportive. It's so supportive and so necessary, I think, for, for evolution to be able to lean back into that. And we're going to talk about that. Um, one thing you said, too, about your mission. I mean, I just think it's so cool when someone knows their mission, because then they can take aligned action towards that mission. Right. And it's pretty clear as to like, okay, this aligns or it doesn't. And we're going to talk about that with rhythm tonight, right? That so much of the pulsation of life is taking that action and also the subsequent surrender. So this becomes the fundamental polarity that I'm going to refer to again and again and again and again. Um, but then also it's aimed at something. It's not just, you know, totally random and all over the place. It actually can be aimed at something. So I'm excited to get into that tonight. Okay, Bob, why was it important for you to be here tonight? The a couple of the words that you and or Noel mentioned and, and flow as well, evolutionary. Uh, and you didn't mention the word gift, but um, mm -hmm. we, we uh, I feel it's important to be here every Thursday night because this is an evolving co-creative space where we explore Barbara's ageless question of what is my gift to the shift in humanity. And we, we, by being here, I can be open to what that question is for me on a given Thursday night or first Saturday of the month. Magi can too, as you can hear her speaking up in the background. And we lovingly, uh, for me to lovingly support others that are exploring and expressing theirs. And, um, so as Noel said, I learn a lot every Thursday night and first Saturday, but I just feel that it's like a corner post of my week to know that there's an opportunity for me to support others and find out with, with you know, first view, child's view, what's in this particular conversation that the conversationalist is bringing tonight. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And what really strikes me about that is that there's this notion of the, the empty the cup. <laughs> Sometimes people have a hard time showing up to a conversation with an empty cup. And it's like, I heard both you and Noel say things of like, you received so much, you learned so many things that you didn't know. And so I, I love that practice. So thank you. Okay, last thing you're going to oh, yeah. talk real quick uh, about it spreading out worldwide. Uh, mm. You know, we're doing four of these a night, uh, four of these a month. And then one of the people who is from Canada that's fairly regular to hear said, you know, but you're not getting the, there are people in Africa and Europe that this is a bad time zone for them to be on live. So let's do one on Saturday at noon, at least once a month. They have mm -hmm. been amazingly attended and we have yeah, had amazing okay. people since January, first weekend, Saturday of January. It's really, it's, that's really international. It's, it is international. And we've had uh, just amazing conversations mm -hmm. there, learned and felt and been able to support. And it is worldwide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Olivia wanted to jump in here. Yeah, please. Yes, please. Did I not? Were you not on earlier at another presentation with another teacher? I think I met you a few months ago on this beautiful community. Um, oh, no. Anyway, it's nice to see you again. I'm glad I'm not crazy. Um, I like being here because, number one, I like the fact that I don't have to run it. That's a big thing for me because I've been an academe for a long time and I'm now retired from that part of my life. And I'm also part of a expanding global community that I'm bringing here to be conversation people. And I love connecting people and I love being able to listen and just take in the richness that Bob and Noel bring, and also I can say Magi. I also like to have Magi. Um, I'm an animal person. And Flo and I were in Egypt together, so it's always a joy to be with Flo. 
And I'm also really interested as you are, Patrick, in alignment and rhythm. I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner that's been the that's core right. of my work. I trained with Moshe. And I'm now um, expanding more into my esoteric healing work, which I used to do. Um, you know, I was a psychologist. I've done a lot of things, but I love the embodiment. I'm a leadership embodiment coach. I don't know if you've heard of Wendy Palmer, mm -hmm. but I'm one of her um, people she's trained. And um, I'm fascinated at how, how do we embody peace? That's really what I'm mm. very interested in exploring and what I'm teaching by learning it myself. And I love that when you're really feeling communitas, which is what Martin Buber used to call it, you have that feeling of inner knowing and and connectedness and belonging. And sometimes it's without words. Mm. And how do we bring that to ourselves? How do we recognize it? And how do we cultivate that in ourselves and in our, and build community that way? Mm. And I feel that we do that on Thursday nights. That's so awesome. Wow, thank you so much. And yeah, I do remember now our conversation about Feldenkrais because it's I'm very interested in that. I was I got into like Bartenia fundamentals and yeah, Lebon movement right. analysis when I was in college. And cool. it, for some reason, as soon as I started to learn about it, I had this like hunger to know everything about it. And so I studied the theory, you know, kind of in depthly and started to learn about, you know, the mind body system and and really what they call this, I mean, it's all, it's all space and dimensions and, and kind of geometry. It's very, very fascinating. And the thing about movement is that it has to exist between two points. You know, right. if it, and it's the fundamental spiritual paradox that we're all trying to reckon with here, you know, on this planet is like, wait, but you know, there's, we can't recognize our oneness because we see duality everywhere because this is a, a world that's in duality. There is dual rhythms in nature. And um, I guess I can start the presentation a little bit here, but thank you all so much because it's like, you're all guilty now. <laughs> you're all guilty of having created the conversation and then where this goes from here on out. And so that makes a big difference. Yeah, go ahead, Noel. I was just wondering the, the questions you, you know, you have uh, the book, uh, is that from the book community or is that from a different book? It's from the same book, yeah. Oh, it's from the same book because I saw it said Alchemy of Community or something down at the bottom. Oh, sure. So maybe that was just a chapter. Okay. That's probably the chapter, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, this dude's pretty profound. He's, uh, he's really blowing my mind. And it's honestly one of the reasons why I just like leapt at the opportunity to come here tonight because it's like just to get to be in spaces with people who are, I forget who said it earlier, but just like who want that depth you know, who want to go deep and aren't afraid to go deep. And the fact that there is depth is all another iteration of a polarity. So now we're in rhythm again. And what's the other end of the depth? You know, we'll talk a little bit about that, but yeah, yes, very excited. All right, let me get this back up on my screen. Yeah, da, 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 da. So everyone's talking about this, you guys. The Taoists are talking about it dual rhythm, dual pulsation, that there are interdependent opposing forces. That's interesting. <laughs> like they're, that's paradox, right? The fact that they're opposites, but they're interdependent. They're dependent upon one another. And honestly, I started kind of tapping into this a lot more when I, I learned yin yoga. That was weirdly my point of entry for yin yang. You know, for some people, it's like traditional Chinese medicine. For me, it was yin yoga with you know, Bernie Clark. And it really blew my mind. It was like, oh, this is everywhere. This is the fundamental governing rhythm of the universe. And I can see this in everything. This is karma. This is cause and effect. And then they're all listed here. So the yang is the male. It's the active summer fire, 
odd, heaven, energy, hyper, right side. And then female is all the opposites. So tranquil, winter, water. You could even say hell if you wanted to take like a mythological perspective and not look at hell as this place that you're banished to forever, but somewhere where you go and come back from. And that's your evolution, actually. Like you can't really evolve. This is Carl Jung, like the roots of the tree. The, the, the branches of the tree only grow as high as the roots grow down to hell. So I find that to be helpful. Winter's hell in a way, because it's like you go outside, you see it, some animals don't make it. You know, there's no food is scarce. And so interestingly, it's like it's hell, but it's cold. The inner energy is cold. It's earth, it's even, it's matter, it's hypo, it's left. And the reason I wanted to include the clock over here on the, uh, on the right is because notice the section where the yang bleeds into the yin. And so it's, it's like it's gradual as it moves from 6 a.m. Or let's say from uh, how about 12 a.m. to 6 a.m how it gradually, can you imagine that like the sunrise, the yang energy as you see it tracing along? And so we're in pulsation now. And one of the important things about pulsation is that it repeats in rhythm. It repeats in some regularity that we have been able to predict, not only predict, but I guess observe, learn from, and then therefore predict. And I'll say more on that in a, in a couple of moments. But just for a definition of rhythm, I always think this is helpful just to help us get like oriented. Musically, I think it's predominantly the place most people think about it. Musically, rhythm is the placement of sounds in time. In its most general sense, rhythm, they have a Greek origin there as well that comes from something that meant to flow, is an ordered alternation of contrasting elements. The notion of rhythm also occurs in other arts, poetry, painting, sculpture, architecture, as well as in nature. So for example, biological rhythms. And Interestingly, cultures have been observing this, this rhythm for a very, very long time. This was taken when I was uh, in Mexico City this winter, back where I got that picture too. <laughs> oh, yeah. And this was the Museum of Anthropology and it was absolutely fantastic. It was, um, it was really, really just fascinating. And I'm learning Spanish. And so let me, I'll do my best to read this on the bottom right. Forgive me if you, if you speak better than I do. But seres duales, la concepción de la dualidad partía de la observación que el hombre hizo de los cambios de la naturaleza en los ciclos agricolos. So you can already kind of hear, you can, even if you don't speak Spanish, you can kind of already hear, oh, ciclos. There's some sort of cycle here. Esencial para estas sociedades que dependían del campo. Durante el preclásico, so we're talking now like 2500, maybe 1000 BCE, preclásical era, son comunes los objetos que representan la dualidad y las figurías que muestren seres con dos cabezas, two heads, o una cara, one body, con tres ojos, or one head with three eyes. And that's the one mostly you're looking up here in the upper right. And, and yeah, I just think it's nice to kind of like dip into the, uh, the native tongue there because that's where these statues were, were being made, right? And this was indigenous cultures all over the place really, but like the concept of, of duality expressed through various rituals gained importance during this era, which may be due to human observation of the contrast changes in nature. So for a very long time, we've been observing the contrast changes in nature. And <laughs> like not only that, but then making symbols and artwork out of them, like what you're seeing here. So my mind was a little bit blown when I was visiting this part of the exhibit based on everything that like, my mom was kind of starting to tap into in the, the introduction she gave that was just like, you learn how to heal with these rhythms. 
like if you can get into rhythm, you can get into deeper healing because it's healing is pulsation. Um, all life is pulsation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the cyclical changes of the seasons and the contrast between water and earth were all fundamental to people's major food source, agriculture. So yeah, rhythm shows up deeply. <laughs> but then as I was alluding to earlier, rhythm also shows up in a really fun way of tap dancing. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is something that absolutely changed my life, was learning how to keep a beat with my body and that there was really an edge to it. There really is an edge to it. So I, I'm actually gonna invite us to do a little exercise. I'm gonna make sure everyone's muted for this. Let me see if I can do that. Can you hear that? Yeah, we can hear that and I think everyone's muted. Okay, cool. So what I want you to do is tap this rhythm somewhere on your table or your chest, or you could do it with your foot. You got it? So hold it now. Try to hold the rhythm. And then I want to ask, how'd you do? Because <laughs> there's something to be said about having to hold the rhythm when you don't have that beat of the metronome, right? So if the rhythm has been dictated, then there's the question of like, okay, how do I get in alignment with the rhythm? And it's very interesting and musicians know this, but basically then you can subdivide beats and like you don't pay attention. To, you can pay attention to like as many little subdivisions of a beat, but also downbeats matter. So like you always know where you can catch up in case you get off. And already we can start to, to see how this is also, you know, in many ways reflected in nature. And so what I thought would actually be kind of fun is to just take a look at this um, really quickly. I'm gonna change my sound source here. And we'll watch just a couple seconds of this tap dance by Eleanor Powell from Fascinating Rhythm, just to give us a sense of like how rhythm shows up in the tap dance world. Because <laughs> you know, one of the things I wanna point out with like what happens when you're tap dancing is that it can be hard to hold the rhythm. And interestingly, it's not usually that people are behind, it's usually that we're ahead. And so I think that this is largely even reflected in culture right now, where we just find ourselves like a little bit ahead of the beat, right? That the harder thing to do right now is to sort of sit back and surrender. And one of the ways that this can be, you know, also demonstrated is in the balance of the nervous system. And so, you know, it's no secret to anybody in the wellness field or the medical field or just the life field in general that usually people are walking around more so in that state of sympathetic nervous system response, the fight or flight, the stress in this constant pursuit and effort to stay safe and to protect what's there and not as much tapping into parasympathetic a parasympathetic is the yin energy. It's the deeply rejuvenative space that you have to kind of pulsate down to if you want to, to grow. So I would really highlight that idea that like the growth is contingent upon the depth. Uh, there's going to be a train going by out here. I've, I've moved to a town where I'm directly outside of a railroad crossing, which is um, quite charming in many ways. I mean, talk about rhythm, right? And the regularity of a, of a train schedule. So what else do I have here? Because I'm also interested in like, if there's any questions, we can let the conversation go there. I'm thinking a lot about, you know, what my, some of the things my mom said and trying to deliver on, on some of that. So part of the work that I do is, you know, as a health coach, I'm a, a certified yoga health coach. and. The woman I studied with, she's a kind of a 
modern guru of Ayurveda. And so really helping me to understand like in these broad concepts from an Ayurvedic perspective that even our day has rhythm. The same rhythm that's, that's like kind of reflected in our circadian rhythms, and circadian cycles. So what are circadian rhythms? Let's go to that first. Because I do think it's interesting how this is very clearly like spelled out both in ancient wisdom traditions as well as uh, modern day science. So we'll start with circadian rhythms. Just like circadian rhythms are physical, mental, and behavioral changes that follow a 24 hour cycle. All right, so um, yeah, and the fact that also like there's a biological clock. Biological clocks are organisms' natural timing devices regulating the cycle of circadian rhythms. And so they're composed of specific molecules that interact with cells throughout the body. Nearly every tissue and organ contains biological clocks. So the mind from an Ayurvedic perspective is in every, every cell of the body, right? So this mind that we think that we have here and we think the mind, the, the deep mind is in every single cell of the body. And then there's this master clock, but I, I also wanted to point this out before we talk a little bit more about, you know, how circadian rhythms show up, but like, does the body make and keep its own circadian rhythms? And the answer is yes. Natural factors in your body produce circadian rhythms. For humans, some of the most important genes in this process are the period and cryptochrome genes. These gene codes for proteins that build up in the cell's nucleus at night and then lessen during the day. Studies in fruit flies suggest that these proteins help activate wakefulness, alertness, and sleepiness. However, signal from the environment also affects circadian rhythms. For instance, exposure to light at a different time of day can reset when the body turns on period and cryptochrome genes. And I, I gather that it's also like the temperature of the body is affected based on exposure to light. And, and the better it can be direct sunlight in the morning, your biological clock, your sleep-wake cycle, your circadian rhythms are going to be set. And then I guess one of the things I'm trying to establish here is like once the rhythm is, is set, there's a way to kind of be in it <laughs> or to be out of it. And it's, I'm not saying it's a, a black and white right or wrong. No, it's, it's, it's movement. So we're always pulsing, we're always we're ebbing, we're always flowing if we can allow ourselves to, if we can actually let go enough the surrender right? We talked about this a little bit in the beginning, this concept of like the surrendering of the mind and the emptying of the cup. So that as you're having a conversation with somebody and or you're co-creating a space, it's not just the content of your mind. It's not just the content of this, you know, the rational mind, which is a beautiful tool that we have, this rational mind. But there's a Jordan Peterson quote that I just love. It's like, it is the greatest temptation of the rational, rational faculty to glorify its own capacities, right? And to sort of elevate its, its meaning to a totalitarian status. Yeah, I mean, do you know anybody like this? It's like me sometimes, <laughs> right? When I just can't empty my mind enough to shifting back to something I said earlier to address the context or the lens with which I'm viewing the situation. Okay. Yeah, he's a, it's the greatest temptation of the rational faculty the, or the mind exactly to glorify its, capa its, its capacities, I think. Or no, I'm, I'm saying the word wrong. It's um, to glorify its, whatever it, 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 it gives birth to in a way. I mean, it could be capacities too. Anyways, you know when you've got someone's voice just like in your ear? I'm, yeah, I think it's capacities. I'm, I'm listening to so much um, Jordan Peterson right now. So anyways, just kind of moving along with this presentation here. We've got the doshic clock. This is reflected, like I was saying, not only in the, the circadian rhythms that modern science is talking about, but from, I wouldn't even necessarily consider Ayurveda like ancient, like ancient wisdom, yeah, but it's, this was their system of medicine back then. And they're acknowledging that like, again, we've, we've witnessed repetitively for a long time now that usually between the hours of 10 and two, doesn't matter whether it's AM or whether it's PM, the energy rises. 
sun is highest in the day, it's warmer out. This is from an energetic point of view, it's hot, it's sharp, there's a spreading quality, it's oily, it's tense. This is also the digestion mode. So Ayurveda suggests that you eat your biggest meal this time of day. And this to me is like a downbeat. We talked a little bit earlier about downbeats and how sometimes when you get off, it's nice to know what your downbeat is as a tap dancer or a musician. So any of these markers here are like downbeats. Boom, mealtime. Boom, bedtime. Boom, time to wake up. And so there's a opportunity to reset. And then you could even take this all the way to the place of like there's an opportunity for, for rebirth in that moment. That's the theme that we're working to in the yoga community that I lead Journey to the Peak. It's this month being the month of April and I suppose Easter weekend as well. Um, Journey to rebirth we decided on. And so we've been spending a lot of time co-creating in spaces about what that means and how that shows up in our lives. And not just on like a, in terms of like, when do I eat lunch, but like, who am I becoming? Who am I becoming next? And I guess that's where I'll go here next. Someone else who's been highly influential for me is the work of like Ken Wilber, integral evolutionary theory. And I think this concept of spiral dynamics is also, you know, Don Beck and Claire Graves. It was another, you know, little mind blown emoji for me once I started studying this stuff and starting to look at the idea that there's actually stages of development that we progress through as we evolve and as we grow. And we can kind of point <laughs> on a map and say, oh, I am, I am here. And then I'll, maybe I'll just shift it back to, to me. I've been able to do that. And I've been able to see where even like there are aspects of my unhealed self who are still a little bit lower down on this spiral, right? Sometimes still a little bit egocentric in the red tribal category and vigilant and aggressive depending on the situation. And so we, we evolve, this is so fascinating, we evolve across multiple lines of development. It's, it's worth, I mean, it's worth pondering that we evolve across multiple lines of development. And you could also say that that's multiple lines of intelligence. And if you're able to actually look at and wrap into your context, the idea that there is a trajectory to the, there's a trajectory to your development and an aim, you can start to take aligned action in that, but it's also like, oh, cool, sit back and enjoy the ride. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because by the time you get to the upper tiers of development, I mean, look at some of these qualities here, integral, teal. So this is the, this is the first leap. You see that there's a space between postmodern green and integral teal. So we've now jumped from these lower tiers into the second tier. Integral teal sees natural hierarchy in systems of systems, holds multiple perspectives, flexible, creative, and effective leading edge of consciousness and culture. Going up from there, turquoise sees the world as alive and evolving, holistic and cosmocentric. So now we're a little bit more even. And that's how each stage works. If you look to the, to the image on the left, you see that each stage transcends and includes the one that came prior to it. So it, it does grow. This is also reflected in you know, astrophysics that there's, there's expansion and contraction, but the pulsation of the universe leans a little bit towards expansion, hence how we've been expanding from the time that they pointed back at the Big Bang. And so you could, if you want to put the Big Bang down at the bottom of the spiral, but again, this spiral can be used in many different contexts. Like it's, you could lay this over really any, I think many situations. Okay, so and one of the reasons I was saying is like, yeah, so it gets more expansive. Let's just keep working our way up these. Because honestly, I think it's like, it's cool to talk about here because I believe that there's probably a lot of like upper tier people, you know, in this community and creating this community because those are the communities going back of, of belonging. that The world is really needing right now. So we're seeing the world is alive and evolving in turquoise, holistic and cosmocentric. 
lives from both the individual self and the transpersonal self emerging now. If you're a yogi, it's like atta, right now. It is, it's in this present moment. Okay, <laughs> top tier, post-integral. Whoa, we're really getting out there. This is like where people go to do, I think like, you know, psychedelic journeys to try to get to these places. They meditate for hours and hours in caves. Um, they also just like, maybe it's service, right? That was kind of Ram Dass' thing in the end. Like he was all about service. In post-integral indigo, you're realizing oneness. You're exhibiting wisdom, joy, and love. This is seen in saints and sages throughout history. And it's theoretical and aspirational. And so I gotta say, I was really lit up by the possibility of this. Because <laughs> it, it provided a context for me that really, I mean, there's so many ways to say it, but one way is like, it really settled my nervous system. I think I said a moment ago, it was like, okay, just sit back and enjoy the ride. Because once you start to understand the the rhythm of the pulsation, it really becomes like a dance. And how that rhythm shows up, you know, in the seasons, how that rhythm shows up in our, in our relationships and our conversations that we listen and then we speak, but it's dynamic, right? So it's not just like the metronome that I was playing for you earlier. That was like that, 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 that. There's a little bit more to it, right? There's, and for instance, I'm thinking right now, even I'm up here just talking a lot. And that's a, that's a new edge for me, right? Leading this group and sort of standing in this seat of what I feel is my wisdom to share. And that's been an edge. Man, I'm telling you, that's been an edge. But I think that's evolution. You know, we play our edges and you pulse back and forth from edge to edge. If you don't, then you're not honoring the the rhythm. And I'm kind of wondering if we either want to open this up or anybody has any questions. I okay. I love what you said, Patrick, about the mind, because mm. um, I've been grappling with my mind in, in trying to allow this book to emerge that I've, that I've been asked to write. Mm. Um, to help people tell their stories at a peace village in Vermont. And so that we know each other. And so we've become a global community. And so people really understand how we've all come together in this century. Um, and what I love is that um, I knew about a month ago that I needed to get out of my head and I went to this wonderful artist that we all know, oh. uh, Ann Hetzel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had seen her being interviewed by Jennifer Ivanko, who you also know, um, who really introduced me to all of you. Um, but what was wonderful was that I knew that I had to paint. I had mm -hmm. to do something that I hadn't done in a long time. When I was a little girl, I always used to draw and paint and pretend I was a horse and everything. I would gallop around and everything. And then my mother died. And after that, it wasn't encouraged in me, except in school, which was different. So I knew somehow that I had to do this radical thing. And I asked her, would you, would you help me, guide me so that I can get out of my head Mm. and allow something else to come through my body, brain, spirit. And so I went there and I did a retreat one-on-one -on -one with her and it was absolutely amazing, mind-blowing. And there was a rhythm to it, which is what was so interesting because she had never done this one-on-one -on -one before. Mm. So it was kind of radical for both of us. And there was a rhythm where I knew that um, I knew when I wanted to paint and when I wanted to um, meditate and she guided me um, mm. with these wonderful meditations. But I also knew that I, that it, I didn't want to paint until I'd done that. I needed to mm. kind of prepare myself to get into a different place. 
And it was very spiritual. It was also very mysterious. Mm. What was what what emerged from the paintings? I had no intention. Um, one painting was more familiar because it turned into a horse, and I always draw horses. But what was interesting was that it emerged from the painting that there was a horse's head. And I had my eyes closed. Mm -hmm. And then the other painting, I had my eyes completely closed. And I, I painted with my hands, my left hand, and left handed. But what came out was amazing. And I did open my eyes toward the end. But, but there's something so mysterious, I think, in us human beings and that we don't, um, because we are so into our analytic left brain um, and not, and our reptilian, you know, we're kind of going back and forth between them, our lizard brain. Um, but there's a deeper thing that comes out when we can get to those moments of peace. And I had to go through a lot of fear. So I thought what you said about fear was very interesting because mm -hmm. I was scared to death when I got on that plane to Pittsburgh. I said, you are doing what? You're going to do what? What are you doing? You don't even know this person that well, you know? How do you dare ask her to do this with you? I mean, all this stuff, you know? And it was, it was one of the great. most amazing things that ever happened to me. So, mm. yeah, I'm still... Yeah filled with joy it's great to do things like that oh. it's great to engage our edges i feel and yeah. to, i mean to do those things that scare us and i mean at least once a day right and yeah I, as you were speaking this what came to my mind was that we think that the mind is contained in the body but the body is contained in the mind because the mind is the it, the mind thinks it's the perceiver. This gets a little bit yogic, right? But it's only because we have the heightened perception and consciousness that we have with this very sophisticated technology that we have as humans that we can perceive our experience in our body. I watch the, my dogs run around and knock heads and roll around. I mean, this stuff, they are so anti-fragile. And this is one of the things, and I'm sure you probably have gotten into this in Feldenkrais a bit too, but the concept of anti-fragility that we actually develop it by stress. And so it's about positive stressors actually. And there's a lot to be said about rhythm here as well, but engaging with those positive stressors, because then it's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're anti-fragile. <laughs> you, know? you don't break when you get dropped in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think it's very interesting. One other little um, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, do uh, you know her? Yeah. She wrote something once that just stopped me in my tracks that was like, you know, the mind is the wind to the, to the sand of the body. So the, the body is the sand and the mind etches patterns into the sand in the way that it blows and, and moves across the sand. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, cellularly, and that's the way all this starts, <laughs> you know what I mean? It all starts in the cells. That mind, it's in every cell in the body. So it's just trying to do its job, right? All those cells are just trying. They know their rhythm. They're little metronomes, right? <laughs> and there's something here that happens with this almost culture lag that like tries to keep us out of integrity with our body. And maybe just to link it back to something I said earlier was like not always a culture lag, but sometimes a culture push that it's like, one step ahead you know we're just like not quite sitting back into the ease of what you know our physiologies were kind of designed for hmm. i think flo you want to jump in yeah um when Whoa, I... your name is so appropriate for this um... <laughs> actually, <laughs> for, actually for everything her name appropriate <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, that's a made up name, so that's okay. <laughs> it's an intentional so, name. <laughs> um, I'm, all I'm the thinking, more. As I'm thinking about the pulsation, um, to me, the first thing was like, well, how does that relate to frequency? Because mm -hmm. I'm into frequencies and how um, entrainment can help your mood or 
take away a good mood or enhance a mood. And um, so rhythm and pulsation must have a connection to frequency. Does it not? Well, I'm just sort of sitting here being so grateful that you said that because, you know, this again, it comes back to the conversation element of like, you're giving me a new piece to add to my model of like, oh, fuck, how does that, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sure it is, you know, but I've, I'm, I'm more peripherally aware of all, entrainment and things, but it's another, and this is where like Jordan Peterson was so influential for me that we just can train ourselves to pursue what's meaningful. So all of a sudden, even as Flo saying that, I'm like, okay, now I know where to go next because that sounded meaningful. And it's a, it's a, it's a reflex, actually. It's a reflex to sort of go towards that. that that's what meaning is, right? right? You can think of meaning as an orienting reflex. And so I've, I've done nothing to answer your question, but I just wanted to <laughs> tell you how, no, I mean, that's why this is important because you guys, I'm just sharing stuff I've been reading lately. I don't get to talk about this kind of stuff with too many people. So it's, <laughs> it's very nice to have a platform where people are open to hearing it. Well, um, Flo, uh, you are reading a book um, that one of our uh, previous conversation was had on called The Shadow of the Baseman, and it's about the true story of what happened to Paul McCartney. I, I'm having a difficult time with it. It's pissing me off. I just got to say that. <laughs> I, you know, well, one of the things they talk about that is that the, the British government and, and you know the, the British services and the CIA and all of them knew how to use frequency to control mood in people. Yeah. And that people were way too happy. You know, the music that first came out, I want to hold your hand and yeah. all that kind of stuff was so positive. And they, they studied it and they know exactly how to modulate the frequency Oh and if God. you look at the, the Beatle music after, you know, Paul died, it went very different because they wanted them to get into the kids to get into psychedelics and other things. Mm -hmm. And then they could, you know, put an end to the peace movements and the other things that were going on. Now, this is a this is a theory, but I do know that the, the government has spent a lot of money studying frequency and how to use that to. Uh, manipulate uh, you know well, and, and that's that's another thing as we um, I think we talked about it in morning meditation is um, with the good of the whole and with grace and the global heart team we always uh, on Thursdays we have meditation sending out love to the world and we've been sending out peace and love messages to Putin well then someone suggested well he's he can't he's blocked from that because the, all of the governments knew about this in the 60s with remote viewing and everything. I don't, maybe, I don't know where I heard this conversation before, but I did. And so they were talking about that you have to go deeper into it and back into his past because his presence will be blocked from these frequencies. So where's okay. where is Putin on here today? Like, where do we see Putin on this chart on the right? Mm -hmm. Oh, or, he's or the, way at the, the bottom, bottom, way at the bottom. Yeah, probably like, probably red, like egocentric, vigilant, aggressive. If you look over here, impulse, domination, power. And so it's it's very valuable to recognize just like I think where people are. And it's interesting. I, I think the love and the vibrations and all that stuff, it does matter. But I also hear what you're saying because there's this concept in Integral, they talk about how you can't really, if you're having a debate, for example, or a disagreement with somebody who's in, you know, one stage of development, you can't use evidence from a higher stage of development yeah. for somebody. And it's not included in their lexicon. It's not a part of their worldview yet. And that's right. why, interestingly, it's really not up until integral teal that we can even hold multiple, multiple perspectives. And that's been totally um radical for me to be able to to sit with because then it, a lot of this stuff gets back to the nervous system too it's like if i can just let my nervous system be balanced that's what i'm talking about of like you just get to enjoy the ride there's there's only response and i'm engaging with it 
right now as I give this talk, right? You know, what would have been a critical or analytical voice is instead grounded in a different reality, mm -hmm. right? And, and present in a different way. And that's the gift of the community is because mm -hmm. I can be safe here. And that's, I think, really, really quite important. And so I, one other thing that's coming to mind that I wanted to say is they say that right now we're about like somewhere between like five to 10% of the population, probably closer to five is, is in these upper tiers of development. And you really only need about five to 10 to do the tipping point. And they actually, they've traced that back through time as well in terms of when we were going from like, for example, you know, modern to postmodern that there becomes this tipping point. Usually they're activists. Usually there's a lot of arguments and this and that, and they're sort of on the fringe or whatever it is. But then all of a sudden it's like the tipping point. And basically this gets back to what we were saying earlier with the ink blot, <laughs> you know, it, it just sort of, it expands. That's the natural pulsation. So yeah, I mean, anything, I, I don't know what our timeline is. I can't remember. Uh, we're still good. So, you know. Okay, great. We started late and we can, as long as we're talking, we're talking, we're conversing. Right, as long as it's, if, when there's a liveness, go uh, with it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Olivia. I just want to go back to Moshe because one of the things that Feldenkrais discovered in observing babies is how the nervous system knows how to go between action and rest. And mm. so when we do awareness through movement, which is one of the components that we teach these, these um, sensory motor developmental movements. You do a movement and you do it with the least amount of effort, which is always difficult for some people like me. I'm always trying to walk my talk and not always successfully, but it's so powerful when you know that as you're moving, like I can turn my head and I'm turning it with much more effort than I need to. And so in awareness through movement, you're learning how to do these repetitive movements with the least amount of effort, the way that mm. babies continually do trial and error. If you look at a little baby, a neonate, a newborn, they're always moving and then they'll go like this. Yeah. And then, you know, or you see a toddler quickly crawling. You know, and there's a wonderful video that um, I'll try to post it called, about Baby Live, a little girl that they uh, videoed at different stages. And what's so interesting is that you see her doing the awareness through movement where she's mm. doing exactly what Moshe taught us to, mm. to teach and teach ourselves first and then other people. So I think what- And those movements are developmental are too. Like we've, we've been able to- yeah, yeah that's you what can I'm sort saying. of say, oh, she's in cross lateral, she's in yeah. you know head tail, yeah. she's in navel radiation, exactly. and it's so because then what they do is like when it comes to your healing journey, you can go back and look and say, oh, something just sort of happened. Then you can reconnect with the body, yeah. and then you get into you know Bessel van der Kolk, and the body keeps the score. Or the trauma, it's a yeah. way of healing the trauma in the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I loved what you said about the wisdom of the brain, of all the brain. The brain is not just here. It's all, you know, even Wilder Penfield said that the brain is a field around the body. He actually said mm, that mm. And, uh, before he died. And he was a great neuroscientist, you know. Um, but what I think is so interesting is that babies know. Yeah. Yep, before they get programmed. Yeah. Before they get programmed. When they're in their most yeah. natural and, and light state, when they're yeah. still, I think, more more so connected to source. And that yeah. just kind of gets programmed yeah. out of us. Yeah. And um and a lot of, yeah, a lot of a lot of crap gets programmed into us yeah. like oh, real yeah. quick. Oh yeah, no, it's it's terrible. It's um it's the pandemic. I mean <laughs> and it's yeah. it's hard for me that we don't talk more about that you know the way that our attention is being competed for and you know what we're being sold and what we're frankly buying you know what i mean and i'm not trying to generalize but like it's it is the it is the mainstream culture right now yeah. to sort of just and it's also a rhythm 
right? And I, I didn't get too much into this, but it was, we got to soften, I think. You know, I think we got to soften a little bit. It's too much in the rajasic from a yogic point of view, uh, which is the, the higher energy. And it, it's not that we necessarily, you know, the opposite of raja is tama. And when that's tamas, it's kind of the, the heaviness and the lethargy. And so what we're actually trying to do is to get into the pulsation between the two so that we can be in the sattvic place, which is the middle place. And that's a good thing to talk about with rhythm is like that, yes, there is the edge of either end that we're pulsing back and forth, but the center hold matters. Because if the center hold isn't held in the center, then it's you're going to have a different, you know what I mean? It's not going to be even in the way that we've kind of been saying. Now, in terms of this idea of <laughs> little effort, that's come up for me in a huge way in my singing journey. I had so many teachers always telling me, you know, do less, do less, do less. <laughs> you're working too hard. You're using muscles to try to produce sound that aren't required in the foundation of sound. Like, let's get you in touch more with the muscles. And frankly, I think like, you know, a lot of people have this because it's, it's throat chakra. You know, it's muscular patterns and the body is so adaptable. It will adapt to what it's being asked to do. And when that happens developmentally, it remembers and it stays. And, but then you go to, well, the brain's, the brain's plastic. And if the brain controls the body, you know, at the end of the day, then how can we start to, you know, use the awareness of the design to enhance our experience? And to have an experience, a conscious experience, an experience that um, he regenerates as opposed to degenerates. And what, what I hear a little bit in like what Noel's saying is, you know, we're not only being like kind of programmed in some ways, but like programmed for degeneration. Like if you Absolutely. look at the habits of chronic inflammation and the way that like most I mean, the statistics on this are absolutely wild. You know, the, the pervasiveness of chronic systemic, that's why they call it systemic inflammation. And it's, um, it's a lot of it's habit and lifestyle driven, mm -hmm. right? And it's, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I did a lot of study of circadian rhythms because my dissertation was on uh, circadian rhythms and body temperature. Oh, and awesome. I actually went to New York City and did a modern day cave study. Uh, wow and uh, was looking at uh, basically what I found is that as a body temperature dropped at night, I would see an inverse relationship with how long it took the, the auditory nerve to respond. Wow. So think of it as the colder you were, the longer it took. So it was a microsecond, but um, evidently nobody ever uh, recorded that before. So, and it was wow. very, very, it got published in Science Magazine. And it was cool. very important because I didn't know that. No, that's so cool. Oh, no, yeah, no. the um, infants don't, are not good body regulators, and, and neither are the elderly. And so, lots mm -hmm. of times, you get false positive on these neurological tests because they hadn't accounted for temperature. But one one of the things that I did uh, find is that uh, you know this whole twenty four hours is really bullshit. It oh, really? <laughs> exactly. We're, we're more on a 26 hour. Oh, but wow. again, they have completely changed our our rhythm. And even think about even think about our calendars. You know, this this funked up 13 months and I can't ever remember. Does this month have 28 days or 31? Yeah. You yeah. know, if we had 13, you know, basically 28 day months, you know, this yeah. is another example of of uh, rhythms and, and things that are taken, you know, for some, you know, why are we using that now? And, um, uh, you know, there's just, uh, why? you know, so many different examples on different on different levels of how we're just, you know, and, and as you said, it isn't to empower us. Right, right. right. But, and I think us. one of the things too, is that like, going back to that anthropological little thing, they basically were like, okay, there's dualism. <laughs> they weren't like, let's fragment it down into as many different like hours, minutes, whatever. So some of this like didn't even, they were measuring um, 
yeah, different frequencies in a way. And I'm thinking even to your study of like how minute that was. Oh yeah. Right. Because now that was meaningful for us. Right. So we pursued it. But back then, I mean, in, you really, I think, witnessed time more broadly. You didn't need a square for every single day. You probably, you know what I mean? There was more of a trust with like the moment of like, okay, we eat because there's food. <laughs> we eat because, <laughs> right? Like, I'm just looking at the, uh, I'm looking yeah. at the uh, Native American Ten Commandments on the wall here. Okay, yeah. And, uh, number, ten, number nine says, follow the rhythms of nature Right. rise and retire with the sun that's right that's right yeah. and it's and the first it's the first, the it's the first and second habit that i coach but the second and third habit that i coach yeah. is early to bed and start the day right sorry go go ahead olivia i was just saying that um indigenous say that it's really the planting cycles oh, and that's sure. really when you look at the mayans and you look at you know indigenous all over the world and certainly we do that at the Peace Village. We have the lunar, we, we every new moon, we have a fire uh, at the Peace Village in the sacred Arga all year round, even though we're a global community and only some of us are local. Um, it's, it's really part of having a Peace Village, you know, that we mm. do honor those cycles and we honor the ceremony of the cycles. Well, don't so get me started on what the moon is. <laughs> <laughs> is that don't get me started on that. <laughs> no, well, I'm, nervous, I'm nervous to ask. Is it the Paul McCartney? It was a satellite. Oh. Oh, oh really? Oh, come on. Yeah, I heard okay. All right. I do have Paul something. Okay. I do have something serious to say, though. Okay. When you're talking about the indigenous. So there is a culture, and, and we were fortunate enough to get to meet some of these uh people they're called the koji that live in the way you know when the spaniards came in were taking all the gold and stuff then they went to the mountain 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 tops and south hid america. out south in south america. america and um the mamos who are one of their leaders they live in a cave the first nine years of their life oh so that they can hear the rhythm and learn the rhythm of the earth yeah. Okay, so this is like, I have to say a couple things on this because, okay. you know, another one of the habits that I coach is sense organ self-care. And so our, each of our senses, whether it's taste, smell, sight, sound, touch, it's an organ. And that there is a, a, a divine, it's a divinely designed organ. And it's designed based on exactly what Nuala is saying here is like the, the rhythms and the emanations from nature. And so when we're not hearing that, that in a very pure sense, it gets like a, a dirty mirror or, you know, it gets a little obstructed, right? And so- well, we're obstructed it, all right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so I'm just trying to piece together, like, you know, some of these things, cause it's like, you know, what, where does this all come from? We look to the culture right now, there's brain fog, there's anxiety, there's depression, you know what I mean? There's, there's violence and there's gossip and there's cancel culture. And it's just like so vitriolic sometimes, you know, it's almost hard to, mm -hmm. yeah. So in service of what though, right? And how can we because I think that there's a place for us to try to engage our intellectual capacities at that level. But again, it's like in service of what? And is it going back to vibrational? Like what's the vibration of the, of the content that you're either putting into your mind? Like what's the frequency of that vibration? Of the conversations that you're listening to? The, the conversations that happen in your groups of friends, you know, and that, I mean, that was a big waking up point for me of like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm thinking this way because they're thinking that way, right? Oh, group and think. Yeah, yeah. So anyways. So as you change your frequency, many times you change your friends <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> Right. Because some people, don't, they don't want to hear what you have to say and they don't, you know. Well, and I'll go one further too and say that like sometimes the end of a friendship is not a bad thing. 
Um, right. Well, sometimes a friendship ends. I mean, somebody passes away, somebody moves. So, mm-hmm. so like this, we're always going through, and this is a good way to talk back about rhythm of like, we're always going through these cycles and there's primarily, you know, you could look at it as three in terms of those doshic clock in the same way, like a, a building mm-hmm. energy or a rising energy, a maintaining energy, and then the destructive energy. So that's like, anabolic metabolic catabolic the hindus like to think about it is like brahma vishnu and shiva and so we always are cycling through a just an end and for people who are trying to like you know change their if you, if you feel like you need to change your life if anyone's listening to this they're feeling stuck they're feeling they can't make progress on something it's like if you want to change your life one of the first things you do is you complete uncompleted cycles. And that ends up becoming, you know, spoiler alert, it ends up becoming a lifelong amount of work because you're always, you're always starting new things. Like how beautiful is that? You're always starting new things, but eventually you get efficient and you start things that you know you can finish too. And you know, when you finish a task or you feel like, whether it's just like making sure the dishes are clean and like, there's a real energy mm-hmm. shift when you can get into like rhythm with completing a lot of those cycles. And so this gets pretty, um, again, it's like we can leverage this then for evolution, which I think is sort of nice. Yeah. Well, evolve or die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. true. Now. It's, it's like evolve, crazy. die get born again and then evolve more you know and they it's... were eternal beings that's yeah. a whole way of looking at this uh thing called easter uh a different way than some do <laughs> that just read one particular book and mm. uh, and mm. you know that it's always living always dying cycle back around evolve yeah yeah well i have to say one thing about um uh, a spiritual teacher that we had a long time ago um Bob was leaving his, his, what he calls his W-2 job, 37 years as an aviation association executive. And, uh, Do you remember back that far? Yeah. No, I don't. As a 2008. <laughs> and so, um, it was a very, very nice departure, uh, from the, the job and, uh, or retirement, we called it a, a rewirement. And, uh, she said, you know, Bob, you just vibrated yourself out of that place. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how it goes, I think. Yeah. It was. It was absolutely. Yeah, it was just like, a, was so you know, so you could go back there and volunteer and, and be a part of it or not. And or not. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. Well, and that's also where it's just like, it's not even up to us in some ways. You know, I've really been experimenting with that over the course of the last year plus. When I was giving this talk to the group last year, I was in a radically different place. Oh my God. I just, I'm thinking back to Patrick then and some of the ways that he thought and some of the, you know, it's in some of the experiences he hadn't had yet, Mm -hmm. some of the beliefs that he had. And that's the thing about belief is like, it's evolutionary, you know, and go ahead. No, I I wanted to respond to something that you said too, Bob, about like, if you look at the Bible archetypically, which I think is, arguably one of the most useful ways to look at it yeah. you do see exactly what you said that's it each one of our stories you know yeah. what i mean it's it really is it's for us whether it's adam and eve whether it's cain and abel whether mm-hmm. it's the crucifixion story there it's us mm-hmm. and i that was another big you know jordan peterson aha was getting some of his psychological interpretation of the bible and so i was glad to hear you say that yeah well you should try a course in miracles you'd have a completely different <laughs> yeah <laughs> really that's our oh latest, yeah that's the latest gig here okay so you're so karen i was talking to karen and i said bob and i are really you know getting so much peace out of the a course mm-hmm. in miracles which is really from jesus no sure. no middleman really and uh, she said yeah I, I said have you ever studied a course in miracles and uh, she said, funny you should ask that. I, a long time ago, I was uh, still involved with the Catholic Church and um, I went there for some counseling or something. And, 
And so the person said, have you ever heard of the Course in Miracles? And Karen said, yeah, I've kind of heard of that. And she says, well, it's the devil's work. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's right. Setting you up for the. (laughs) It's just like, it's, you know, just um, a beautiful, beautiful, uh, you know, it just doesn't take the Bible seriously. It takes it metaphorically and beyond, way beyond. Yeah. Mm. And uh, just found it very, very peaceful and loving. So, well, meaning, I mean, that from which we can derive meaning is just absolutely um, remarkable to me. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, guys, we we conversation list out tonight, or you got a few other things you want on your mind? Mm. Super casual evening. This yeah, yeah. I'm happy to love it. thing. I really appreciate the other um, things that were brought into the conversation. It's exactly what I said earlier. It gives me more to think about, and it's so nice to have it be a collaboration. You know, when you said that you uh, that that uh, Patrick of a year ago, it just uh, I giggled myself. Uh, I have because of our travels the last since we began to wake up since our travels around the country, we haven't really been in one one zip code for much, but we have Mm. years. And so I actually have gone to a men's group at our local Unitarian Universalist Church. First time I've done that. And so uh, early in our introduction evening, and whatnot, somebody said how old they were or what their age was. And then uh, somebody introduced the idea that we don't refer to these as ages, we refer to them as levels. So by the time we finished, introdu- people on the back part of the circle came around and said, well, I'm level 57. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so this idea of, uh, you know, it's a recognition of what, what you were just saying, Patrick, is, um, Interesting to take a view back at Patrick uh, one year ago, version version one year ago. And um, that really makes us, for us, I think it's one of the things that makes people very confused about what they guess our chronological body age is. Mm. Because that's this last 15 years or so has been just that, is start anew, start anew, start anew. Yeah, yeah. And there are also ways that you can test now cellularly what your biological age is. And it doesn't necessarily correspond to, you know, the amount of years that you've been on the planet for, which I found to be very interesting because it all has to do with stress in a way. And, And how is the, how is the cellular structure bearing the load of stress or, or, um, how is it handling in a way the load of stress that it's being that it's being asked to bear, you know, mm-hmm. and and how much can we take on it's from a from a cellular point of view? It gets all into what your allostatic load is versus how you use that for homeostasis, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. yeah, and so then you start to like measure age in a different way almost, and it's it's mm-hmm. yeah. And you could take this right to a conversation of like, well, then how do you want to use the structure of time? And, mm-hmm. and what does it look like when time actually opens up for you? Because if you feel constricted in time, that's like when a tap dancer has too many beats in a measure. It's just like, and not in a good way. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you want there to be some space. That's what they always tell. Like, I think improvers at first is like space, just like listen for the spaces and this taps into something that was being said a moment ago of like, we're kind of trying to favor that now if we can. This mm-hmm. is why it's like, get into a yin yoga class, get into a restorative class, <laughs> get your Paris, anything to downregulate your nervous system is a worthwhile investment. <laughs> you know, It's a good rule of thumb right now. Yeah. Thick, um, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh always said too, you need space around, <laughs> space around. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Nice. And, and thinking about that with rhythm, it's like how you structure your day, even like, are you giving yourself space in your day or are you always putting more in, more in, more in? A lot mm-hmm. of my friends are struggling with this right now. We talk about it. It's like I go from Instagram to TikTok to Facebook to oh God. You know, Twitter and then then they go again. 
I mean, I was I'm thinking of this conversation I just had with this friend. She was like, I check them all. And then as soon as I'm done with the last one, I start again. And I just, you know, keep looking for, I mean, they call this doom scrolling. It's, um, <laughs> doom, <laughs> what is it? Doom, what is doom, doom scrolling. Yeah, it's basically like when you see somebody on their phone and they're on social media apps and they're just going, you know, it's, uh, it's, thing. it's an addiction. It's very, uh, it's, it's a problem for a lot of people right now. It is an addiction. And, you know, when, um, mm. also in my research that I did, uh, in my doctoral studies was, uh, the effects of alcohol on circadian mm. rhythms. Ooh, ooh. And, um, what I found was, yes, it did, uh, definitely disturb the circadian rhythm, but I literally got students very drunk and was measuring their, um, their rhythms. And how'd you get the volunteers drunk. for that? Oh, at the University even, of Illinois, there was, they there, got there was a long line all the way over to Urbana. <laughs> I have my own sleep laboratory. <laughs> what was the what was the flyer like? <laughs> <laughs> Word of mouth, baby, and I didn't need a flyer. She, she didn't need to put it up at the. Uh, <laughs> no flyer needed. Bar. Everclear. <laughs> yes. Well, I love it. Oh, oh, so, so anyway, I would, you know, of course, get the, I do one, one day of their, their regular rhythms, checking it, you know, every hour, taking up uh, a measure of the auditory system, which is very sensitive to minute changes. And um, then uh, get them drunk and keep doing the measuring. And uh, what I found is that they actually went, they will wake up in a, like a sweat and I don't know if you ever remember being recovering from a, a, a drunk, but um, kind of getting wake up in the middle of the night, and you kind of feel sweaty or something like that. Oh, yeah. And their temperature would just like skyrocket up. Hmm. And um, as now, they, did, did any of that depend on like their their general state of health? Like were there some who were able to handle it somehow better? Because you always hear about that. Like some people can just drink and it like, doesn't affect them. <laughs> I don't believe that. It's, yeah, it's. I don't believe that. It's it an may, that's true. That's true. Way. Mind over matter because it just it does tend to kind of wreak havoc on the physiology. Yeah, that's a good way to disrupt the systems. But you know the the TVs, all these electronics. You know, I didn't even know about this five G stuff. Is supposed to be wreaking havoc with our with our rhythms. Go ahead, Olivia. I just want to say that I've been learning about this for some time because I've been concerned about it. And uh, alcohol actually, or the 5G? Uh, 5G. This is okay. A, I'm telling you, no, this is something that's called key, Synergy Key. Um, I can, I'll look it up because I've ordered actually, um, um, it's kind of like a spool this big, and I've ordered it. You can have it 30 days and you can return it if it doesn't work. And then a little one for Richard to put in his pocket because he's always on his phone. And what happens is it creates a torus field. Mm. The little one like this creates um, six feet up, six feet down, and 16 feet all the way around. And what it does is it prevents radiation. So mm. I'm going to be experimenting with it. <clears throat> and I'll keep you posted because yeah, I decided please. I got a really strong intuition that I should do something about this. I'm very mm. sensitive. and. Um, I've been worrying about EMFs um, and the fact that I want to get a meter because one of my, um, this medical intuitive that I've studied with has got a meter and went around her house mm. and it affects everything, Patrick, everything, mm. circadian right. rhythms, sleep, um, tumors. I mean, you know, it's really important and mood. Yeah. It's really, really important. So I'm, I decided yeah, to write right. the bullet and I'll let you know because I'm very concerned about it. 5G is the worst. Mm. And I've mm. been fighting against, I don't want 5G, but yeah. it's in yeah. the air. It's like you walk outside, it's everywhere. And, um, and we really have to speak up. I mean, I remember when my clients were speaking up against cell towers, you know, in Lincoln, Massachusetts. And, and you know, that was the beginning of this awareness of what is bombarding right. us. Right. Um, well, anyway, I'll keep you posted, but I did. Thanks. Yeah, the airlines are trying to get rid of 5G around. Uh, uh, Terrible. Airports. 
because it's interfering. You have a lot of friends who are, you know, uh, airline captains. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, it affects the flights, right, Bob? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's navigation. Yeah. It's just that's that's you know, but, known uh, frequencies. So, so the well, solution I, I is think, just live in a Faraday cage or go up there and join the Koji. I <laughs> well, and I, I, mean, I, I guess I do. I think I tend to be a little more optimistic in terms of this because I, I you know, I think it's important. I think what you're saying too is like we have to take the measures that we know we're going to protect us you know what i mean and just to circle this back to one other thing i kind of forgot to go to and i wanted to make sure i include is like you know noelle talked about her mission earlier and i really do feel that this is very much aligned with you know my mission is helping people kind of have a context to understand like the way things are mm -hmm. and and how they can build a life and, and have a worldview and a framework and a support system that really facilitates this ease that we've been talking about, you know, this whole conversation, right? With all the environmental toxins that are out there, with all the, you know, the emotional toxicity and the, all the crazy stuff that's going on, I still believe that we're, we're divinely designed and that it's it's really our birthright to be able to get into accordance with that design and so i've made it really the nature of what i do now and so awesome. i've got journey to you upper right hand corner here this is the annual program that i run mm -hmm. journey to the peak down below that is the monthly yoga immersion myself and shauna emmerich you get both yoga asana classes and a lot of community support and I also did want to let everyone know that I am hosting this New York City retreat first weekend of June. We're going to be doing the awesome ancestral healing workshop with a colleague of mine, liberating structures. So really trying to tap like collective consciousness of the community, the members who are there and yeah, have a conversation about like, what are our values? <laughs> What's the purpose? What's the vision? And again, both on an individual and a collective level. So if you're looking for a reason to, to hang out in New York City, come hang out with us. And just send me an email if you're interested in any of these things. I'll put my email in the chat, I guess. And Thank you. Yes, yeah. please do. Cool. Thank cool. you so much for Thank you. coming in. This has been wonderful. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I love seeing, you know, I've seen you over the years and you just keep blossoming and blossoming. <laughs> well, I learned some new things about, about each of you, really. So <laughs> I'm thinking specifically of uh, one thing for each of you. And I just am so grateful that you shared a little bit of that and that it we could hold true. You know, my mom gave me that awesome introduction <laughs> and also hold true to what this group is, a true a true co-creation of the conversation. And uh, yeah, I really believe we need that right now. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all.